because Jake realized his computer's upstairs. Oh. <laughs> We're live. And we already have some people in the room. So people are going to trickle in, but I'll do an introduction. And as you guys know, we keep these live unedited. Um, so you guys are basically here with us um, as we're chatting tonight all about pelvic floor, which I'm super excited to learn something about since some of you guys know I'm pregnant right now. Um, Caitlin's trying to hide her husband uh, <laughs> who's shirtless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just running around the house. He's like, I need Teresa my says hello. So for those of you guys that are in the room first, let's have you guys say hello and where you're coming from just so we can see or maybe how you heard about us. Uh, we're so excited to meet with you guys tonight. My name is Kristen Oja. I'm a doctor of nursing practice and founder of Stout Wellness. And tonight is extra special because this is my sister and I wanted to call her Caitlin Corbin and I had to remember that she is now Caitlin Raymond. So we are super excited. We obviously love her husband, Jake, and they just got a puppy, Arbor, because um, we don't like work to identify us. But Caitlin is also, she's a doctor of physical therapy and she chose to specialize in pelvic floor which we're gonna be getting into today. Um, she's also a personal trainer and she teaches fitness classes at Stout Wellness and she teaches a lot of our stability classes and strength and stamina, but she does all of our 5.15 uh, a.m. classes on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So you guys will have to see her when we're able to open back up. But this is also a really great time to have a good conversation of things that we can do at home during this quarantine to help our pelvic floor. And Caitlin also, she works at Atlanta PT, which is in Smyrna. Um, you guys take some insurances. Which one do you take? We take Blue Cross Blue Shield and Medicare. And then we contract with some other insurances based on whoever pays their claims. So you can always call our front desk and see what they can offer you. So what's really cool is they're doing telemedicine, kind of like we're doing with Stat Wellness, they're doing telemedicine for physical therapy. And while Caitlin specializes in pelvic floor, she also does all over physical therapy. So if you guys are in here and you're like, I need physical therapy and I'm quarantined to my house, uh, reach out to Caitlin at Atlanta PT um, or some virtual personal training with Stat Wellness. We've got you covered. Um, so we have, let's see who's introduced themselves. We got Teresa, Amanda, Molly, Lindsay, Katie, Margaret coming from Charlotte, North Carolina. Jackie, congratulations on the baby and the puppy, right? They're both, they're both hard <laughs> yes. work. Yes. Um, Jackie heard about it from Stat. Awesome. Well, we're so glad to have you guys in, and I know some more will be trickling in. But Caitlin, I wanted to first um, hear from you, because this is one of the things, knowing you my whole life, that has been surprising <laughs> that you've gone the pelvic floor route, and it's so needed. So what got you passionate about pelvic floor? It really was just a lot of small things that led me to pelvic floor physical therapy because why Kristen says it's strange because she's known me my whole life is because before I even went to PT school, I did not like to be touched. I did not like to touch people. So it's really funny that A, I'm a physical therapist and then B, that now I'm doing pelvic floor physical therapy, which is probably the most intimate type of physical <laughs> therapy. <laughs> So I just started getting more into Pilates based rehab and I went through a six month with Polestar and a lot of that was cueing for the pelvic floor so it kind of like introduced me a little bit more into what pelvic floor physical therapy looks like and then I started shadowing a bunch of different therapists and a few of them would do pelvic floor and I was like this is so interesting I also had a classmate who kind of sparked it in us too because she was very passionate about pelvic floor so she would like talk about it and like why it was important and stuff like that where when we really went through physical therapy school we probably got like one or two lectures about it total. So you really don't learn a ton about it. And so by seeing other people practicing it, um, it got me a little bit more interested. And then I realized it was, I feel like I'm the kind of person that can make people feel uncomfortable in an uncomfortable situation. So I was like, pelvic floor physical therapy is for me. And it's a lot of education and it's a lot of different things that go into pelvic floor physical therapy. So I like talking about nutrition and referring people to you for hormones and all that kind of stuff. So it's a little different type of physical therapy. So did you do like a weekend training once you discovered you wanted to do pelvic floor? Or like what does the education look like since you really don't get much in school? Yeah. So when I decided that I was like, hmm, maybe I'll like take a course. I did my first course through Herman and Wallace and it was a three day course and you jump right in. So after that, when I like enjoyed it and really loved learning about it, I was like, wait, I know I need to do this. So since then I've taken three or four more courses 
Um, but you can go on to get different certifications and stuff like that, but really it's, there's not like a ton of regulations right now for it. But, um, so I did like a few courses and I like loved it. And then I started seeing patients and it's like no turning back. Yeah, I love it. Well, Molly, um, you bring up a good point. Molly said that pelvic floor dysfunction and how it works is not talked about enough. Um, so that was one of the things I wanted to talk about is I've been in functional medicine, holistic medicine for almost nine years now. And I really feel like it's something that's been talked about a lot more even recently within the last couple of years. And you look at other countries and it's amazing to me that you have a, a baby and you go home and you have a pelvic floor therapist as part of your rehab after delivering a baby, where here that's not standard practice. And so I kind of wanted to get your thoughts on one, is this just like, are we learning more about the pelvic floor or two, are we just talking about it more and becoming more open or why are we seeing this movement now where we're talking a lot more about pelvic floor health or pelvic floor dysfunction? It's like relatively new. If you talk about all the different types of medicine that have been around, it's within the past like 10, 15 years. So like, it's definitely been there, but I do think that now, like thinking about like, just talking about like the year of the woman and all this stuff, like people are now more vocal about their bodies in a way that they weren't before. And some people still aren't vocal about it. It's hard to talk about these things, which is also why people don't really bring it up to the providers. I actually read a statistic that said 90% of people would not, that did have pelvic floor dysfunction, do not feel comfortable bringing it up to their healthcare provider, which is crazy. Um, so I think do you also- think it's an embarrassing, uh, embarrassment thing or that they feel like it's maybe normal and there's nothing they can do about it? It's probably both because our society has normalized a lot of things that are going on, especially in the postpartum population, like peeing when you laugh or when you jump or like all these things like pain with sex after you have a baby. Everyone's like, oh, this is just the way it is. Like no one is like, wait, you don't actually have to experience in those things. So I feel like we're starting to get more out there and there's definitely more f pelvic floor physical therapists being trained and stuff like that. But it's just that especially with like doctors and stuff, they were trained these certain ways and it just wasn't part of their curriculum, just like it really wasn't a part of my curriculum. So they do what they were taught. And so uh, it's not necessarily their fault, but it's just not as brought up as much as it probably should be. Well, the more I've learned about it, I've changed our new patient paperwork and the way I do new patient visits to assess um, and try to figure out if people have pelvic floor dysfunction. Because I think a lot of it is, that people think that it's just normal, like, oh yeah, I had a kid and now this is what happens. I get up four times a night to go to the bathroom and I've done that ever since having my child. And it's just, they're normal, so they don't talk about it. Um, so it's really empowering to know that a lot of these symptoms that we've already brought up are not, um, they're not normal and they're not, they're, they, they are things you shouldn't live with your whole life. So if you're having these symptoms as we dig deeper, make sure that you guys want implement some of the things we're gonna talk about tonight but to go and talk to somebody, find a pelvic floor physical therapy or um, look at somebody with functional medicine that takes a holistic uh, view of your health. So we've talked about pelvic floor, but some people in here may be like, what in the world is pelvic floor? So tell us like, what does that mean? Yeah, actually, hey Jake, can you grab my pelvis? I left it over there, um, <laughs> <laughs> left it on the bar cart. Um, so the pelvic floor, a lot of people are like, mm, maybe I know about it. Maybe I don't. So I actually brought my model home from work. Thank you. Um, okay. So here's our pelvis and I'm just going to briefly, there's a lot more detail I could go into, but I'm just going to briefly go through it. It sit, it sits at the bottom of our pelvis, which our pelvis really gives our whole trunk stability and helps us move and everything. So a lot of our power comes from our core and our pelvic floor is a vital part of our core muscles. So you always hear core, 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 core. Um, and so it is like a bowl and it kind of sits like a hammock at the bottom and it gives support to our organs. It's really important in our bladder function, bowel function, sexual function, also our stability. So when we take a step or anything like that. Um, and so we have three layers of muscles the first two are more superficial and these are it's your uro gen, um, genital uh, diaphragm and so this is what is going to be more important for continence and also sexual function and then our deeper muscles which are also closely related to our hip muscles which you can't see in this model um 
they're more of the support um, for the organs and all that kind of stuff. Because although you can't see them here, our bladder sits like right in here, our uterus, if you have a uterus, a uh, prostate, if you're a male, and then your rectum right back here. And then on top of that, all the other organs, like your intestines and stuff like that. So it's very closely related. Um, and so it's an area that it's made up of muscles, ligaments, fascia, all this connective tissue that people don't talk about. <laughs> Just like our muscles here and our muscles here, like it's skeletal muscle. We control it. It gets tight. It might get weak. It gets pain, like trigger points, just like our upper traps do. Um, so our pelvic floor actually holds a lot of tension. And that is one of the causes of some of the dysfunction. So um, I think I kind of answered what the pelvic floor is. But if you guys have specific questions, like, please throw them out there. And just kind of did a brief overview. And I think it's really interesting when you say we can control it. Because I think so often we don't think about actually activating those muscles ever and thinking about the fact that we can control it. So I think that's, really and they, and they should, when they're functioning normally, you don't have to think about it. Like they're going to function to the demand that you need. Like they're going to yeah. tighten the amount you need. They're going to relax the amount you need. They're going to work with your breath. But when you do have dysfunction, that's when you're like, okay, I need to start thinking about this. And it's really hard to think about those muscles. Cause like, unlike our biceps where we like lift something up, we can like feel and see our bicep fire, you cannot see your pelvic floor um, fire. So, and when you yeah. are doing pelvic floor exercises, I always tell people you shouldn't be able to tell you're doing them right now or else you're compensating with other muscles. So um, that is the hard part. Yes. And Molly, we are going to answer your question um, a little bit later on because there are a lot of different things we can do to help just keep a healthy pelvic floor, even if you're asymptomatic. Um, so stay tuned. We're going to definitely talk about that. So we know what the pelvic floor is. What are some signs and symptoms? You've mentioned some of the urinary symptoms, but what are some signs and symptoms that some of our listeners may be experiencing that could tell them they have pelvic floor dysfunction? So any kind of leakage at all is not normal. So even if it's just like maybe it happened when you jump or when you sneeze really hard or when you cough, um, that's not normal. Stress incontinence is probably one of the most common I like, I wrote some, I wrote it down. It was like, um, so after, so before kids, 10.9% of women have stress incontinence after kids, 37.4 reported stress incontinence. That's 14 times more likely, um, to have that after kids. And that is totally treatable. Um, so any kind of leakage like that, actually bowel dysfunction. I see a lot of people who deal with constipation or any of those IBS symptoms, because when you're having a lot of inflammation in your gut, which Kristen can talk way more deeply about than I can, it's going to lead to those muscles being irritated, the nerves being irritated, and other um, pelvic floor dysfunction that I can treat as a musculoskeletal expert. And then Kristen can also treat as the hormone and gut expert. While you're talking about the gut, what are some like things they can see with their bowels when they have a tight pelvic floor? So this is the most common thing I hear from people. Well, first of all, if you have a hard time even going to the bathroom and you're straining a lot, if you don't, like that's going to lead to a lot more stress on your pelvic floor. And that's really not good. We can talk about bowel mechanics in a little bit too. But what I hear a lot from people who have tight pelvic floors is when they finally do have a bowel movement, it's very stringy and pencil-like, which tells me that they're not actually able to relax their pelvic floor to have a bowel movement. And so what happens is they're trying to like push, push against these tight muscles. And a lot of times it's just a coordination thing. There's a lot of other things that can happen too, like slow transit and stuff like that. But coordination, like people sometimes, like we talked about, don't have great awareness of their pelvic floor. So when they think they're bearing down or like tightening to help release the stool, they're really tightening their pelvic floor because they don't know the difference. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like the biggest thing I see with bowel dysfunction. Um, so Squatty potties, that helps um, a lot. And then also just working with your breath and awareness of your pelvic floor. Which Caitlin got all of us in the family squatty potties for Christmas. So we all got one um, to help us with our bowel mechanics. So yes. it was a good, useful gift. Um, what about, you talked about like pain with intercourse. Is that is that for both males and females or is that more of a female symptom? That's actually for both male and female. So it can be pain during or it can be pain after. 
Um, and that actually is very common. I saw a statistic that said one in five women have experienced pain with sex. That's a wow. lot. Yeah. That's like a lot of people. Um, and a lot of times that's, there's lots of things that can go into that too, but a lot of times it's because your pelvic floor is tight. And like, if you have a trigger point here and you're pressing on it and it's painful, that's a lot of times the reason people feel pain with intercourse, especially women, um, yeah. men, their pelvic floor also gets tight and they'll feel pain, especially after like ejaculation and stuff like that. Cause that's when those muscles are firing a lot. So and we know that it happens because we're mentioning right now in males and females, but like who has pelvic floor dysfunction the most like statistically or what you see in practice? So what I see a lot of is the postpartum population or just younger women who have just got married or they're just like in a serious relationship and they find out that they do have pain with sex. And there, a lot of times people are like, well, I have always had pain with gynecological exams. I have had pain with inserting tampons and they didn't realize that for a long time they were having these symptoms. Um, so that's what I see the most of. Um, but there is a lot of incontinence that we see, especially in the, as you age, you usually have more pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, so things like urinary incontinence, urinary frequency, urgency. So not, even if you're not leaking and you're going to the bathroom um, like every 30 minutes, every hour, that's also telling me that you have pelvic floor dysfunction. We should really be going in between the two to four hour window. So is that when they get older, is that their muscles becoming weaker or is that still tight. So it just depends on the person. I would be like, yeah, most likely it's going to be because their muscles are getting weaker. Also, I found out that most people as they age, they've come in and they've had a hysterectomy. They've had some kind of surgery in that down there. Um, and so that's what I see a lot of is people who've had these issues, had surgery, still have the issues. Um, but I actually have seen older people who do have tight pelvic floors. And just because you have a tight pelvic floor doesn't mean you have a strong pelvic floor. It's yeah. like if your bicep is tight up here all day, it's not actually strong. Like you can't then go like lift weights with it because it's been shortened the whole time. It's actually going to be weak too. And more likely. Um, so, yes. So that happens. Um, that's like the main thing. I usually assess to see like, is it truly just weak or is it tight and weak or is it just a discoordination thing? Okay. Yeah. So what, what are some causes that you see? I know we've kind of touched on some of them, but what are some other potential causes that can trigger pelvic floor dysfunction? A big overarching one that I see is people who have these uh, breathing patterns that they get into that can then, and other things, factors in their life can then put into the pelvic floor dysfunction. But a lot of times people are, they're like holding their breath when they lift heavy weights um, they're holding their breath when they're on the toilet, even if they're not like super constipated or anything, but they're still holding their breath. Um, I see a lot of people who just don't have any idea what their pelvic floor is. So maybe they were fine until they had a baby. And then after the baby, it was a little bit more weak because that's a very traumatic thing that happens. Even if you don't have tearing, even if you have a C-section, your pelvic floor muscles are still affected. And so a lot of times people just need to learn how to re-educate them. So I see that. Um, I see people that have pain with sitting. So maybe their muscles are tight down there. Their nerves are irritated. Their whole sympathetic system is just revved up. And so I see like a lot of people who just need to get some down training, um, like breathing and relaxation and that kind of stuff. So it's kind of a variety of why people exhibit these symptoms. But the bottom line is they don't have good coordination of their pelvic floor muscles. They might not be breathing correctly during the functional tasks that they're doing, especially if they're weightlifting. Um, they might um, just be getting older and not really paying attention, having good control over those muscles. So things like that. What about like trauma? I know that's something you and I talked about, like sexual trauma. That's a really big one. Um, so that's another also crazy statistic. I was reading a book that I highly recommend if you're interested in this kind of stuff. It's called The Body Keeps the Score. And in that book, it was like one of the first statistics shared. It said one in three women have experienced some kind of sexual trauma. And that is crazy to me. 
And it doesn't even have to be sexual trauma. When we have any kind of trauma, like I said, our body gets really tense. And so that can lead to pelvic floor dysfunction, even if it had no specific impact on your pelvis. Um, but trauma is a huge thing because a, you get, it goes back to a lot of psychology, which I'm not specializing in psychology at all, but it's just that we get into these things where we don't even maybe know that we're tightening the pelvic floor constantly, or if some kind of something triggers those like memories or anything like that. And it's just really hard. Like it's most likely going to be like touch or something. So it's really hard to, you got to like work through a lot of different aspects of this. Um, but trauma is a huge, um, reason for pelvic floor dysfunction. And I talked to an energy healer, um, who was telling me that you hold a lot of your grief in the pelvic floor. Um, mm -hmm. and so I know that's one of the biggest things that I see with pelvic floor dysfunction in practice is cortisol elevation, just being in that fight or flight and that body stress response and just everything being tense, um, playing a big role. So I always suggest like really making sure, you know, like if you're, I always ask my patients, like on a scale of zero to 10, where would you report your stress? Zero is no stress and 10 is like the worst stress in the whole entire world. So, you know, I really like to keep my patients at like a five, six out of 10 on a regular basis. So if you guys right now are sitting here at home in this quarantine or whatever it is, and you feel like your stress is like an eight or nine out of 10, it's going to cause physical symptoms, whether it's your pelvic floor, it's going to cause tension or whether it's your heart and your blood pressure or whether it's your progesterone levels and your other hormones. So just be aware of the connection with stress when it comes to the physical body, because there is a huge connection there that we need to be aware of. And I always say at the end of the day, ask yourself, like, were you really thriving or just surviving? If you feel like you're just surviving each day, completing one task after another, running around um, throughout the day, like it's really time to take a step back, even if it's like a five or 10 minute breath work, um, to just bring down that cortisol and help with the um, body stress response. Breathing is like the first exercise I give everyone, no matter what they come in with, because it's so connected to our pelvic floor, like our diaphragm, like taking a true, like big, deep breath all the way to the base of our lungs, our diaphragm moves, our interabdominal pressure is regulated. So our pelvic floor should lengthen. And so it's like this whole system that works together. So breathing and it's so great for our parasympathetic system. So I just always give people breathing because we want to use the pelvic floor muscles with our breath um, during all activities. Um, and so I always get that. Also, Molly asked, um, would having the use of retention and enemas lead to pelvic floor dysfunction? So if you have to use an enema every so often, rare, it's not going to be a problem, but you should really figure out why you're having to use the enema. Um, so if it really is like, oh, I have a lot of patients sometimes say that they like to use it frequently, but their problem really is just the coordination of the muscles. I would highly recommend that you see someone just to kind of see why you're having the have to use them. Cause if it is just coordination, you can retrain those muscles so you don't have to use them so much. And I think even looking at bigger things of you know, how is your magnesium level? How are your thyroid levels? Like, is that impacting motility, um, stress levels and cortisol? Like what's happening with why your digestion is slowed down or you're having incomplete bowel movements? Um, and you have IBD. Yeah. So for IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, there's a lot that we do. Um, okay. Yes. So do you take mesalamine as a medication or you're using enemas with the medication? Um, so there's a lot of different things you can do with IBD. Our world in functional medicine, we do a lot of stool analysis. We do a lot of food sensitivities and we take a deeper dive into gut health to see what's going on. Is there, are you lacking good bacteria? Do you have too much of the potential bad bacteria, which we look for things like dysbiosis? Do you have yeast overgrowth? Like what is the, what's going on within your gut? What's going on with your new hormones? Because in our world with every autoimmune disease, we believe there's some triggers, it's inflammation in your body and it's immune dysfunction. So what's triggering inflammation and this immune dysfunction? And is there a way we can calm that down to hopefully help? Um, of course, medications are needed a lot of times with IBD while we're trying to figure out the root cause. So your situation may be a little bit different, Molly, and you definitely don't stop your medication by any means, but we would definitely love to help figure out the root cause or see from physical therapy if there's a way to calm the inflammation by working on the muscles.
Mm -hmm. And those two go together a lot of times. It's not just like do the functional medicine, do the physical therapy. It's a lot of times like doing the functional medicine route and figuring out the root cause of the inflammation is really helpful to like stop the inflammation. But then also the fact that you might have had a lot of this chronic inflammation leads to those musculoskeletal issues that we were talking about earlier. So, yes. And I always think it's really good to work on the physical body and the internal body, like hormones, nutrients, everything at the same time. So great mm -hmm. confidence for each other. Yes. Uh, so I'm sure a lot of the people, even based on the statistics that are listening, have at least one or two of the symptoms that we've mentioned when it comes to pelvic floor. Um, and I think too, one of the things we always talk about is if you don't have the symptoms and you're in this room, it's just as important to stay healthy. So this is very much on having a healthy pelvic floor and then some tips to kind of help treat pelvic floor dysfunction. So what are, one of the things you've mentioned a few times is breathing. So why don't we start there? What are some of the breathing patterns that you recommend? So it's really just about, so a lot of Americans chest breathe. We don't even realize it. We're breathing shallow breaths. We're breathing quickly. We're not really taking a full breath in ever. We're not slowing down to take a full breath in, or we're just not even aware of our breathing. Um, and so the first thing I instruct is diaphragmatic breathing. A lot of times people call it like belly breathing, but I like to emphasize the like abdominal area getting bigger when you take an inhale and also your chest area. You want those both to get bigger when you take an inhale. So like I said earlier, I'm going to put this down so you can kind of see my hands. Um, our diaphragm. Sharp. Yeah, I had to wrap stat. So you have your diaphragm up here that sits um, underneath your like rib, it's like inside your rib, ribs, kind of like an umbrella. And when it, it contracts, it pulls down to be flat so that the lung, air, lungs can fill with air. And so when our pelvic floor is functioning optimally, we should be able to take a deep breath in and our diaphragm should come down and our pelvic floor should lengthen slightly. And then when we exhale, our diaphragm should recoil back up and our pelvic floor should come back up. And so the biggest thing is I like to start people there is taking deep breaths and like really taking a deep breath in through your nose, making sure you're not doing this. That's the first thing I see when I ask people to take a deep breath. So making sure your shoulders are staying down, taking a deep breath in. Hands on your ribs is a really helpful cue so that you can take a deep breath in and expand into your hands. And then thinking about what's happening in your pelvic floor. So it's totally normal to not be able to sense anything going on down there at first because you're not used to it. But it, after practicing a lot and visualizing it and stuff, you should be able to sense your pelvic floor coming down slightly. And then when you exhale, coming up. And then I usually build on that. So it's okay if you don't feel what's going on. It does take practice. Don't get frustrated. We don't, we can't see these muscles. So it really does take time, but taking a deep breath in, and then you can take it to the next level by then kind of lifting up a little bit on the exhale. And that, um, I wouldn't recommend doing a lot of like key goals right now. Cause especially if you're having problems, cause a lot of times it's the tightness first that we need to relax and then strengthen. But that's how, what I do a lot is build on the breath, bring the pelvic floor in and the core muscle, other core muscles into function. So like if you're leaking, when you stand up from a chair, bring in your exhale that will help you tighten your pelvic floor before you stand up. Or if you leak, when you squat heavy weight, make sure you're using that pressure system to your advantage, exhale on the effort. So I say that in almost all my workout classes, people are probably like, okay, we get it. But I'm always reminding people exhale on effort, exhale on effort, because that's going to really help. Um, I love that. The ease and the E exhale yeah. on effort. Yeah. So does position, if you're just starting to do some breathing does, I know you mentioned putting your hand on your ribs, but could you do it from a laying position? Could you do it from a standing position? Do you need to be sitting? So I personally, it's really whatever you feel like. Some of my patients are like, I prefer to do it sitting because I can like be more mindful about what I'm doing. I personally prefer to be laying down with my knees bent up and my feet flat. And then I like to put my hands on my ribs because I feel like I don't have to think about my body, my posture, anything like that. So I usually instruct it first lying down. And then also you're, if we're really working on your pelvic floor awareness and stuff, when you're lying down, it's kind of like gravity assisting it rather than when you're sitting up, it's a lot harder to sense that if you do have a lot of weakness or something like that, because it's against gravity now, um, depending on what's going on. 
So with your knees up, you're talking about like in a sit up position, and then you bring your yeah, hands. To kind of like show you, like this. If you can see me, I can't put my head all the way down, but just like yeah. laying it down with your legs bent up, or you can even put some pillows underneath your knees. Um, just get comfortable. Really, it's about how you can really get comfortable. Think about your breath and not be thinking about my phone's ringing the microwaves beeping, like all the things that are going on right now. Uh, all your kids are running around. <laughs> Is there a certain amount of cycles you recommend? Like if somebody's doing deep breathing to see more of the benefit? Um, so for me, when I'm prescribing deep breathing, I'm wanting them to just focus on their awareness and to kind of help them relax. So a lot of times the people I'm prescribing this are like, it's already hard for them to just sit down and do a little bit of the breathing. So I always start with five cycles of breath, five times a day, not that hard to do. If you're breathing in for like four or five seconds, breathing out for four or five seconds, that's about a minute. And so it really is, doesn't take that long, but if you do it throughout the day, it's really helpful, especially if you have pelvic floor dysfunction, because the kind of and it brings our awareness throughout the day rather than just doing it once in the morning and focusing on like your exercises and then not thinking about it the rest of the day. So I always say five cycles, five times a day is where I start. Um, I don't have any like research article to back that up. I just think it's easy to remember. Well, and one of the things that I do unrelated to my pelvic floor, but just with getting some deep breathing in for hormone balance, which now I know is really helpful for my pelvic floor but it's every morning, every night, I make sure to do breathing. And then I try before each meal to just really sit down for a second and take a few deep breaths. Yeah. And so I find with my patients, if you can put in those five cycles in relation to something that you do every day, or maybe it's a certain time of day, like every day at seven, 10, three, you know, something that helps you remember, because it's so hard to remember, did I breathe today? Did I do those deep breathing? Yeah. And like one said, we're we're, sh we're shallow breathers naturally. So just put that in relation to something that you do or a time so that you can be more consistent. And that's and exactly what I tell people when you oh. wake up breakfast, lunch, dinner, before you go to bed, five there's times. five and it's done. I mean, it's it just, it's so much easier to do it when it's something you can remember and do every day. Um, and not only is that going to help you with your pelvic floor, it's going to keep it healthy, help with the dysfunction, but it's also going to help you with hormone balance, which is really important um, with your pelvic floor too. What are some other things that people, well, I had a question going back. I didn't ask it earlier. Um, running and like really high impact exercise, does that put pressure on our pelvic floor over time and weaken it or strength? Like, is there a uh, connection between those two things? That topic actually was just brought up um, from this company that I get email blasts from. It's hard to say because there's both sides. Physical activity actually helps strengthen your pelvic floor, but then if you're doing too much or not having great mechanics, not, not having great breath cycles, stuff like that can actually impact your pelvic floor negatively. So it really, again, I know I sound like a broken record, but it really does go back to the breath. So like if you're doing a ton of heavy lifting and you're holding your breath and doing all these kind of things, like that's gonna be negatively impacting your pelvic floor because when you hold your breath, it's a lot of downward pressure on the pelvic floor. Um, and so, but if you're, I'd say physical activity overall is good. I would never tell anyone to stop doing any physical activity except for if they're that specific physical activity increases their symptoms. So if you're leaking when you run, but you're not leaking until one mile in, I say run for the mile, like, or try to find that sweet spot so you can run until you don't leak and then slowly start adding more in, but start adding in like your strengthening exercises, your pelvic floor control, your breathing when you're running, making sure you're not just taking little breaths, but you're able to take those big um, inhales, exhales while you run. So when you're running, you don't need to think about like pulling up your pelvic floor or engaging it. That could make it worse. It sounds like you really want to focus more on the deep breathing, even while you're running or doing cardio. Um, yeah. So that. Like, jumping is a great one. You want to exhale right before you land so that that kind of gets it to contract because we want it to contract on the exhale. And if yours isn't doing that right now, it's something where you need to start training so that when you are jumping and you do exhale, it does contract. But Basically, you want to be able to use your breath to like 
help with the pelvic floor functioning, but you don't want to keep it tight all the time. That's a, a big thing, especially with women, is we like to pull our stomachs in all day. So when we pull our stomachs in all day, we can't take a deep breath. And so our diaphragm can't really come down. And then when we are trying to take a deep breath, it's a lot of downward pressure or the pressure needs to go somewhere. It's not going anywhere here. And so then that can lead to other dysfunctions like hernias or pelvic floor dysfunction, all that kind of stuff. So we're not meant to keep everything tight all the time because back to the bicep, if we keep it tight, 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 then it isn't strong. It's just the muscles just short. Um, and our pelvic floor science shows us that our pelvic floor fires when we fire our transverse abdominis and our core muscles. So if we're gripping with our stomach all the time, we're most likely gripping in our pelvic floor too. So, so time with abdominal muscles, is there certain core exercises that are really good to help with pelvic floor dysfunction? Um, yes. So I, that's like where I kind of progress from. So we start with the breathing, we bring in the pelvic floor and we bring in the transverse abdominis at first but we really want to focus on all the core muscles because we can't just look at the pelvic floor ever. It's a part of a bigger system that involves our core muscles, back stabilizers, the diaphragm, which I already talked about. So all those things, we really want them to be functioning optimally too. So I do a lot of like spinal stability exercises. I do a lot of like what you'd say is like core strengthening. So um, if you've ever been to my class, we focus a lot on finding our hip points, moving our fingers slightly inward and downward. And when we fire, this is to help fire the transverse abdominis, but it's one of our natural corset muscles. So it's really helpful in stabilization. So we can do it all together. So find your hip points, move your fingers inward a little bit. And so we'll use our breath first to find it. And then we'll, um, we can talk about it with other exercises. So when you inhale, you want that muscle to kind of lengthen so you want to breathe deeply in. And then when you exhale, I want you to exhale like you're blowing out candles. And then think about drawing your two hip points together slightly. So it's a very subtle movement. If you're feeling like a ton of contraction, you're probably using a little bit of too, too many muscles. Because we have a lot of other muscles, our obliques, our rectus abdominis, that six-pack muscle. So it's very subtle movement of that, that will feel like a little tension right where your fingers are. And so I like to start there and then add in different like limb movements. So if we can fire that muscle and stabilize our core and keep our pelvis stable while we move our arms, our legs, that's what we're doing all day. Like reaching for this right now, I'm like needed to stabilize at some degree to pick this up. So that's where I start. Um, and there's lots of different things that you can do with those exercises, but that's the base, like being able to contract that muscle and move but we want to be able to lengthen and tighten, not just tighten. So Jackie was talking about that she's not crazy for thinking de degenerative disc disease could significantly influence her pelvic floor problems. No. Um, so a lot of times too, like everything's so closely related. So it kind of goes back to like the chicken or the egg, whatever started hurting. But when, when you have a lot of pain, our pelvic floor responds to it. I read a blog by someone who calls it the threat mom, oh, um, threat meter or something like that. So basically saying that like, when we have any threat on our system, our pelvic floor responds. So if we're having pain in our back, our pelvic floor is gonna respond. Um, also our pelvic floor muscles can refer pain places. So if you've gone to physical therapy or gone to the chiropractor for years and years and years, trying to get this back pain or this hip pain to go away, it might actually be your pelvic floor res like referring to your back or your hip. So there's lots and lots and lots of, um, I see a long question that we, um, that we can do and uh, where our bodies are so connected. We can never just focus on one aspect of it. That's interesting that she had to have her pelvic bone adjusted because it was uneven. Do you see that a lot? So um, I do see it. There's a lot of different schools of thought on this. But yeah, there are a lot of reasons why people can have like different rotations or things like that happening in the pelvis. And then also this kind of goes back to I was reading something about like pregnancy. So like when you are pregnant, your ligaments get a little bit more lax. So then when you're pelvis is maybe shifting more than it normally does all those muscles around it try to tighten up to help stabilize it so um so robin she never ended up having to go to a pelvic floor specialist but she is doing yoga 
and they talk about the pelvic floor occasionally in her classes. So she was wondering for older women, which 62, Robin, you still got a lot of time ahead of you, but some <laughs> in their 60s, what do you recommend for exercises? And then painful intercourse, she was told the only way, uh, the only remedy was hormones. Any thoughts on exercises for somebody in their 60s and um, any remedies for painful intercourse besides hormones for those patients? So I would really, I would have you start really focusing on your pelvic floor specifically, trying to increase your awareness while you're doing these exercises. So I love yoga. I think it's awesome. Um, and so that's really helpful because it's like stretching, it's stability, it's breathing, it's all those things. Um, and then also the fact that you are probably having some painful intercourse, that makes me also think that you might potentially have some tightness in those muscles. So it really would depend on how you're presenting um, on what I would really have you be focusing on. But taking the breaths and increasing your awareness of the pelvic floor actually lengthening down and coming up, you can do self-assessments too. So if you don't feel comfortable actually feeling those pelvic floor muscles internally, you can just put your hand on the outside of your, it's called your vulva region. It's not just your vagina. The whole area is called your vulva. Um, but you can put your hand there and then you can feel when you take a deep breath in, does it kind of come down into your hand a little bit? And when you exhale, does it lift off a little bit? You can even roll up a towel and sit on it. So you can kind of have that tactile feedback. If you feel comfortable with it, I highly recommend even using a mirror. Like most women have never even seen down there. But if you put a mirror down there, you can kind of see like what happens when you contract? Does it lengthen back down? Does it stay up? Does it not really move when you're doing anything? Those are kind of things you can start doing a self-assessment. Um, but a lot of those times it's helpful just to have someone look at you and kind of tell you maybe what's going on in your body and try different things. I hate that they told you the only way was hormones. I would love to like check out other reasons too. Hormones definitely probably are playing a role too, but. And Robin, one of the other things that I do that's hormone free is I have my patients use vitamin E oil to kind of help rejuvenate the tissue. So if it is really your muscles are fine and it really is hormone depletion causing dryness and pain and tissue changes, vitamin E oil is a hormone free option that can be really helpful. Um, so definitely I would see a physical therapist and how many, so that's one of the things like, cause a lot of people have some questions, like if somebody came in to see you, I have a few questions. One, when you're just talking to somebody, are you able to tell if they have a tight floor or too weak of a pelvic floor, or is that really why you need to do an internal exam to be able to identify it? I never need to do an internal exam. It gives me a lot of um, information, which is helpful, but I never need to, especially if someone has a history of trauma or you just don't feel comfortable with it. I'm not ever going to be like, I have to do an internal exam. Um, but yeah, just by listening to people's subjective, I usually can have an idea of what is going on. And that usually is the case. Um, and so it really goes down to it being tight or weak. I feel like for the longest time, we have done a disservice to ourselves because everyone just talks about kegels. Like literally everyone's like, my doctor handed me this like panned out on kegels. I've heard all about kegels. Like it's just always tighten the pelvic floor. Like everyone, that's all we ever heard about pelvic floor. And so I find that the majority of people I see, it actually is just tight and weak. So um, the biggest thing that I would say is like learning how to down train. So like finding time to do like self-care, relaxation, deep breathing, and a lot of the tissue around that whole area. So like inner thighs, those adductors, the glutes, the back muscles, the abdomen, all that stuff, you can do different like soft tissue, seeing a massage therapist, seeing a physical therapist. Um, I do a ton of skin rolling just to calm the system down um, and loosen the fascia all in there and stuff like that. So um, there's, I kind of went on and on and on about that. Um. <laughs> well, one of the things that I hear from a lot of my patients and why they like doing the internal is that you guys can also help identify if they're tightening or loosening the right muscles, because there is such a separation where it's like, am I tightening the right muscle? Am I relaxing? Like what is actually happening? So it's really nice, at least at the beginning of when you're trying to have a healthy pelvic floor, or if you're experiencing pelvic floor dysfunction to make sure with the pelvic physical therapy that you are tightening where you should and loosening where you should. Um, and so I think that's a huge benefit of doing that internal exam as well. 
Um, yeah, tells us a lot about like side to side differences. And a lot of people are like, oh, but I go to the gynecologist and I get checked out and they check out my muscles. They are not, they're trained to make sure all the organs are doing well and nothing's abnormal. They're not trained to be like, let's check out these pelvic floor muscles specifically. So um, that's another reason why, like, just because you contracted and relaxed maybe in their office doesn't mean that they were really looking at those muscles specifically. Yeah, that's huge. And one thing, Molly, I didn't want to skip her question. She was talking about vagina weights or the yoni okay. end. Um, what are your recommendations? And then I had one to add to that um, that we used to use a lot when I was in my OBGYN practice. They really loved the Intone device. And I talked to a lot of pelvic floor therapists that really don't like any of those things for people to do at home. Um, so, so I want your yeah, I have never, ever, ever, ever recommended vaginal weights or the yoni eggs. Um, again, this goes back to it. It's not always because your pelvic floor muscles are just like need to be strengthened. They do need to be strengthened, but in most cases, they need to be lengthened before they are strengthened. And so when we just insert these weights or these eggs, it's reinforcing that tight, 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 tight muscle. So it could potentially make it worse. And then also why I don't love them is because I like to have you be able to control your pelvic floor with function. And so if you're just putting some eggs up in there and then walking around doing your normal day, it's going to be wanting those muscles to contract a lot during random tasks that you might not even need your muscles to be trained to contract that much. So I would, I I find it, there would have to be a very rare case for me to probably recommend those devices. Um, the only device that I've really heard good things about, I personally haven't used it, is there's a device called the LV. And it's just basically, um, you insert it into your vagina and it tr it's like a uh, EMG, basically. So it's like picking up your muscle activity. So it connects with your phone and it kind of helps you see, are you contracting it? Are you not? Like that kind of stuff I'm okay with. Um, I don't really like the idea of weights. That's one of the things that we did with the Intone. Um, so they have the Intone and they have like the Apex and in some countries too, like everybody goes home with an Apex as well. So it's like very highly used, but it has the electrodes on each side that can also stimulate some of the contractions for people that aren't able to stimulate contractions on their own. Yeah. Um, so I think like hand in hand with uh, PT to know, like, are you somebody that's too tight or too weak can make a big difference. Yeah. And Molly's asking the tips for lengthening. And I think a lot of the tips for lengthening come to the breathing and the relaxation, right? Yep. And then also like hip stretches while you're doing deep breaths. Like a lot of times um, a good position to hold is that yogi squat. I think I can do it here and you guys can see me because I'm already on the ground. Um, but sitting where you have your heels down and your knees out, you can even lean against a wall if you can't get into this position. But this is a great position to just, I personally can sense my pelvic floor more in this position. And it's a great position to help lengthen the pelvic floor. Taking deep breaths here is very helpful. Um, there's a lot of things you can do to downtrain your system. Like I said, like you can maybe do some of like the skin rolling techniques, um, the deep breathing, hip stretches, and really just increasing your awareness of that area. Um, because when you do have a tighter pelvic floor, it feels normal to have your pelvic floor in this position. So it feels very normal. You might get a little contraction and then come back to here. So it's gonna take some time to kind of get that awareness of the fully lengthening. So sometimes it's helpful to have someone help you realize your like kind of help you re-educate those muscles. But yeah, back to like the breathing and stretching is going to be huge. I love that squat. It's so comfortable too. I know. Uh, Not everyone can do that. Don't be sad if you can't. You can yeah. sit on a block or something. I have a lot of mobility. Uh, Marissa was asking, why does this happen to women after pregnancy? Um, Marissa, are you referring to more like pelvic floor dysfunction in general? Uh, I think that's what she's referring to in general. I don't know, Kayon, if you want to touch on that. Yeah. So you're growing a human being in your body and that gets heavy actually. So even though it's only a few pounds, your body, like your organs are moving, it's expanding things. First of all, you're having different hormones in your body. So your tissues are getting looser. Um, then you have that prolonged wait for 10 full months. Um, 
And then you have either a vaginal or a C-section delivery. So you're probably pushing to some extent. Um, those muscles are getting lengthened. When you deliver a baby, you're also your pudendal nerve. So one of these nerves that innervates these muscles gets stretched. Um, and so that's like one of the biggest things too with people is when you do have a baby vaginally or even C-section and the weight of the baby stretches the nerve a little bit, that's what kind of can weaken some of those muscles. Um, and so you just need to build up that integrity in those muscles again. But that's like- One ahead. of the things that people don't really realize is it's like not only the seven pounds of the baby, it's the uterus growth, like the uterus itself weighs a bunch, the placenta, the amniotic fluid, the baby, like it's a lot of weight there that is, as Caitlin talked about, where the uterus is just kind of sitting in that pelvic floor. Um, and the other thing is when you're pregnant, and I was even talking to Caitlin about this, that relaxin um, is produced, which helps to relax your lig ligaments and tendons because everything's expanding and growing. And I can even feel like I called Caitlin. I was like, man, after workouts, I just feel like like my ligaments and my tendons, I can just feel it more. Like even in my elbows, I just like move and you can just feel the changes within your body from the hormone changes and the relaxing. Um, and so I don't know if this is true across the board, but are most people after childbirth, is that is, is that a period where you are working on re-strengthening those muscles? Um, where other parts in your life, it could be that you're too tight or too weak. Is that a period where you really are? Um, again, it depends. So a lot of people who, I don't want to say a lot of people, but I've also seen people who have had C-sections have really tight pelvic floors, but they still need to be strengthened. But vaginally birth, I do see a lot of people just needing to be re-educated on how to fire those muscles and bring them into function. So overall it is going to be strengthening, but you could still have some tightness because like I was talking about earlier with all that relaxing too, and our pelvis maybe moving a little bit more, your muscles all around that area want to tighten up to help stabilize you. So sometimes people have the pain because the muscles are tightening. So really depends that's great. <laughs> on the person. One of the things I called um, Caitlin and, you know, I personally want to have a natural delivery. I'm not opposed to medications. C-sections, you know, whatever works for the mom is really what's the most important. So, but for me, I really want to do a natural delivery. And so I've been talking to Caitlin and tell them about like the massaging that you think that I need to be starting to do at like oh, week yeah. 30 <laughs> this or 35. Is, this actually is very, very important. And I, I wish more people knew about it. It's called perineal massage. So right around 35 weeks of pregnancy, you need to start stretching your perineum. So that area um, it's like kind of downwards and around your vagina. And so what you do is you can put a little bit of lubricant. Um, I always recommend like water-based lubricants without all the toxic stuff in it. So slippery stuff is what we use at our clinic. You can use coconut oil, um, whatever works. You can have your partner do this. But basically, if this is the vaginal opening, you want to place your finger in and you want to kind of press down at first, kind of stretch the tissue and what you guys can all do at home, if your hands are clean, I've been like touching the floor, so I'm not going to put my hands in my mouth. But if you pull your lips apart and you feel that like sensation of like a little bit of like a burny sensation, that's the sensation you're looking for in your perineum so that you're actually stretching it. Oh, yeah. Do you feel that? Yeah. There. yeah I do. <laughs> so that's what you're looking for and doing it just five to 10 minutes, even just once a week is shown to be really helpful in decreasing tearing. So not saying it's going to hundred percent make it where you don't tear, but it does help. So it, I'd say do anything you can to help that. Um, and you can well, then start moving it. into a you. Yeah. So yeah. I told Kristen and Cameron that they need to be starting. And I, I said, I'll educate Cameron on how to help you. <laughs> I'm willing to do anything I can to make this a better um, experience for sure. It's very important. And if you don't want to do it yourself, come see a pelvic floor therapist. I will do it for you. I think that's awesome. Maybe I'll come see you as my sister. I'll be like, hey, help me. Yeah. Uh, anybody else have any questions? This is a lot of really good information. I know Tina said she jumped in a little bit late on the webinar. Um, and this would be good. And I don't know, I'll try to persuade Caitlin to see if we could get some exercises um, that are good, the breathing exercises and maybe some of the abdominal exercises that are good to just do like a quick post or even posting some of them on Atlanta PTs where maybe we could just reference them over there. Yeah, we're actually in the process of making a ton of YouTube videos right now on our channel. So I will comment it in the box, a link to our YouTube channel. I've already made personally a bunch of videos and I'm going to be putting out a lot more videos. So subscribe and check out the videos we posted there. And then I can do maybe like a short um, 
video for you to share Kristen too, with people who have signed up for this. Yeah. I mean, get it on the um, YouTube too. Cause I know Anna was asking if we could do a pelvic floor flow slash relaxation video for stat. I think that would be a great idea. Um, so we'll work on it, Anna. Um, any other questions before we wrap up for the night? This was so good. Um, and obviously a topic that is a hot topic. So we'll have to do more of these. Yes, I'm pulling up this link so I can post it so people can go to it. Any other tips for in for being pregnant? Um, pregnant right now? Oh, What'd you say? I wanted to know if Margaret was pregnant right now or how far along she was. Um, yes, lots of tips. So at first, really just keeping up with the activity level that you're already doing and then just being mindful about like your pelvic floor, doing some core strengthening. So some of the stuff I'll be sharing, um, your transverse abdominus strengthening, stability work, pelvic floor work, tightening and lengthening the pelvic floor. Um, and then as you get further along, it's important to start doing some of the perineal massage and then also trying to think about what birthing position is going to be best for you. That could be a whole nother talk that we can have. Um, but if you, um, you can play around with different positions where you can test to see what position you can actually relax your pelvic floor in better. Um, I've had a lot of people tell me that they love side lying or half kneeling. So depending on if you get an epidural or not, you can still do side lying with an epidural. But um, so there's lots of different things that you could be doing. Any birth classes that you recommend or that you've had your patients do that you suggest? So there's so many out there. Um, I don't have one specifically that I've like totally dove into. So I know everything that they talk about yet, but there are like tons of, really great resources. There's like midwives out there and doulas. I highly recommend a doula. They really do advocate on your behalf and educate you on a lot of things that before getting into this field, I didn't even know that people needed to be educated on. Um, there's lots of different ones like hypnobirthing, the Bradley method, like all this different stuff. I would just research different types because they're going to be different for what type of person you are. Like everyone's going to respond differently to different birth classes. So I don't have a specific one that I'm like all for. It's really dependent. And I'm glad to hear you like Bradley. I was looking at Bradley and Lamaze and then Molly, I have not heard of Meraki mama. Um, I'm going to have to look at that. I love that. If you guys have any other ones that are listening that you recommend comment. Um, and Margaret, yeah. I'm so excited. We're both 15 weeks. That's so exciting. Yeah, that's exciting. And then I uh, saw Lauren say, can this impact the severity of period cramps? So that's a whole nother topic that we should talk about too, because it would be really good to talk about the hormone aspect with Kristen. But I'll, so there is a lot of information I could share. So I'm trying to figure out how I can be precise, like brief, but having really horrible periods is not normal. So like, yes, bleeding is normal. Yes. A little bit of cramping is normal, but having debilitating cramping, nausea, anything like that is not normal. And so there are a lot of things you can do. Um, it goes back to kind of down regulating. I know I need to get Arbor over here. I think he's, um, so there's a lot of things you can do to like down regulate the symptom with the breathing, some soft tissue massage to the abdomen, to the glutes, all that kind of stuff can help with the cramping. Um, and really just helping to like relax your pelvic floor can help too. But, and one of the biggest things that I see, which is connected to with the um, hormones and muscle tension is estrogen dominance and low progesterone that can really cause some of the intense cramping before your cycle. So Lauren, I would try all the things that we've talked about on here. And then you may want to consider if you haven't had your hormones checked to at least get like a good panel at the right time in your cycle and see if we can um, navigate. That's you. you. Charlie. Hi, Charlie. I haven't seen Charlie in a while. Our baby. That looks huge compared to my little baby. I'm going to grab Arbor to put him in the in little bit. I know. Where's Arbor? Arbor is sleeping. You oh. guys, total, total side note, but Caitlin, I got to show you these. <laughs> Look at this little baby. Oh my goodness. So Everybody is getting bigger. Hi, Arbor. He's like, why did you pick me up and wake me up? He's How huge now. Look at he this. now. He looks so much bigger. We're going to take him to the vet next week. So we'll find out. Hey, Sorry, what we're gonna show Is that for Charlie's paws? We got her four for her, her paws for all the Wait, runs we go on. I can't wait to see that. 
And you guys, I put this on her foot, just one of them. And she like held her foot up and was so, she like froze. She was so mad. So I'm trying to get them on all four. They, it's it was so cool. going to be that video I showed you guys. Oh, it is that video times a hundred. They're like, it's so <laughs> funny and poor thing. They said like, do not just stick it on them and laugh because that like, they feel very like, they can feel that you're laughing at them. <laughs> so, which is exactly what I did. I put them on her and I laughed and I feel horrible. You're supposed to just like set them on the floor and then like give oh. them up on the streets. Um, <laughs> but Lauren, anyway. Oh no, Molly said, when's the best time of the month to do your hormone testing? So it depends, Molly, if, you, uh, if you're doing them for heavy cramping or um, some of those symptoms, I like to look at the mid luteal phase. So about day 19 to 21 of your cycle, um, because that's where progesterone should be peaking. And then it comes down before estrogen starts to take over. If you're looking at estrogen dominance, or if you're looking for fertility, day three of your cycle is actually best to look at your hormones. So it really depends, but we either do it day three, or we do it day 19 to 21. So just in general, I like to look at it day 19 to 21, because most of our population is lower in progesterone from high stress and other um, reasons, more estrogen dominance. And we use the Dutch test um, a lot. We also do labs through LabCorp. Um, so we can do standard labs through insurance, but the Dutch test is a dried urine test that looks at all of your hormones, your estrogen metabolites, progesterone, cortisol throughout the day, all sorts of things. Yep, day 19. Oh my gosh, Arbor is just like sleeping like a baby. Just so sweet. <laughs> I know. I he sleeps a little bit and then gets hyped up. Anthony just got home, so he's like, Ooh, my friend. He's like, who's there? He's like wagging his tail. So cute. Well, you guys, thank you so much. If there's no more questions, we're going to end for the night. Um, thank you, Caitlin, for taking time out of your day to meet with us. This was a He's lot of fun. Hey, hey, let me you put my email in here so you guys yeah. can email me if you want have any questions. And I was going to say, also put your Instagram, um, Atlanta PT, like some of the different ways they can get a hold of you too. Arbor's licking my armpit. <laughs> and then, oh gosh, he's falling off. That's my Instagram, Poise PT. Follow me. Yeah. I'm getting more content out there. Social media is hard and I need to figure out my, what I want to be sharing. <laughs> Well, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Have a great week. Oh, and before I forget, tomorrow night at 7 p.m., there's another free webinar on an introduction to functional medicine. So we're going to be hitting some hot topics. We're going to be talking about inflammation, digestive health, hormone balance, blood sugar control. We're going to be talking about a whole slew of things. Um, so it's going to be really good. So tune in tomorrow if you have friends that you want to hear, um, have them hear about functional medicine, spread the word. Um, completely free, 7 p.m. There'll be some good discount codes, lots of information. Um, so thank you guys for tuning in and have a great night. Bye. Bye, guys.